Hi, everybody. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming. I really, really appreciate it. My name is Keith Marison. I'm the cartooning coordinator here at the School of Visual Arts, as well as one of their teachers. And um, this, to me, is like one of the highlights, I have to say, of our, our school year and really our program. Um, I started out wanting to be a gag cartoonist for The New Yorker, and so it's extremely meaningful to have Mr. Bob Mankoff here tonight. Uh, I teach all my classes at the very beginning talking about the secrets of everything are in the New Yorker gag cartoon. We go through the history, but then we talk about, for me, the source of humor, which is much more simplistic than what Bob uh, knows and talks and studies, but it's about two or more things put together that create an idea. Why are elephants big, gray, and wrinkled? Because if they were small, smooth, and white, they'd be aspirin. Sorry, it's a stupid joke. It's a dad joke. It's the only one I know, but elephants and aspirin don't go together. You put them together, and maybe there's something a little bit funny about it. And then we talk about the golden ratio conflated with a rule of thirds, the 60, 40, 70, 30 compositional aspects of how you bring up that idea aesthetically and what you see first, second, third, and why. This works for fine art. It works for gag cartoons. It works for graphic novels, because you have to think about that for every panel you do, for every page that you do, for the book about what is the idea, why are you making this image, and what are the aesthetic ways that you're bringing up that argument. Works for Goya, as well as it does for Charles Adams, and I think all the eternal secrets of art, especially figurative, narrative, allegorical art, could be found and seen in the New Yorker cartoon. We're very pleased, and, and part of the not-so-secret idea and mandate of this evening is that we now have, in the continuing ed program, a gag cartoon class in place with the incredible Emily Flake teaching. Emily is a sophisticated, smart, sweet, nice, and very funny person who's teaching our very, um, for those of you who aren't at SVA right now, um, very affordable class that you could take that's not like grad school because the tuition is very, very little, but it is like grad school in that you're getting the top New Yorker cartoonists of the younger guard teaching you the wonderful ideas and strategies of not only the gag cartoon, but the short form comic, which means like a one or two page comic, which is very commercially viable these days. All the magazines want them. Your web comics are oftentimes short form comics online, in addition to humor writing and ideas of humor. So please, if you don't currently go to SVA, Think about taking Emily's uh, continuing ed class. It's on Wednesday evenings. And the golden carrot is, at the very end of it, Mr. Mankoff will be reviewing the work from that class. Um, in undergraduate, if you are currently an SVA student, even if you're an MFA student, you could take Emily's class that we're going to have place uh, for the undergraduates starting next fall. Same class, same ideas, but really intrinsically working with you all, the canonical students that make up the best part of SVA's history. We've, we started out as a cartooning school. Um, it's always been great, but now I think we're better than ever with the best students and the best faculty than ever in the history of a School of Visual Arts. It's true. And Emily really is a wonderful addition to um, our staff and our faculty. And I um, implore upon you to please take her class. It'll teach you everything that you need to know about anything that you might need to do, uh, whether it's cartooning, illustration, animation, or fine art. Emily's class will be top notch. And the same idea goes that uh, Mr. Mankoff will be reviewing your work at the end of the class. You guys, the New Yorker isn't just about rich white people anymore. It's about everybody, and not that it's always been about everybody, really, but sometimes people get this feeling like, oh, no, it's that, but it's not. It's, it really is for everybody, and humor is a sugar that helps the medicine go down. We really need great comics, great humor, great gag cartoons that help a lot of the sort of the denser, maybe darker material than New Yorker be a little bit more affable, and frankly, more than fine art, it's those cartoons that we look at for the rest of our lives that are so meaningful and become part of our lives. So. Um, uh, Bob really wants diversity in the New Yorker. He wants more women, more people of color, more people of different orientation, gender fluidity. Everybody and, and anybody is welcome to submit. Um, and the New Yorker really is a, a free grad school cartooning class for, for you all once you graduate or even if you're out. 
The basic idea I'm sure he's going to go into is that you submit 10 cartoons a week, every week on Tuesdays. And the neat thing is that you get to hang out with all the great New Yorker people who are still there, who still come into the waiting room. You become friends with them. Uh, Bob looks at your work. He gives you criticism that you take very professionally with a smile on your face, realizing that he's helping you help yourself become a better artist. And then you take it home and you change up the ideas if you believe him and you bring them back along with new ones. And you do this and you do this and you learn a lot, whether it's for the New Yorker or for anything, it's like a great way if you're serious to continue your pursuit for this incredible and very special medium. And uh, so part of our evening tonight is really about that, planting seeds for your future, whether you're an SVA current student or if you're out of uh, school and you're really interested in comics, know that The New Yorker wants you, is very interested in you and what you could bring to the table to help to diversify the magazine and its cartooning. So this is really very much part of our program. This is a fun evening that's about a movie and uh, Mr. Mankoff's incredible insights, but it's also too uh, very much about planting the seed for the future for SVA for The New Yorker and for cartooning in general. We're, we're big believers. We need to keep this thing going and pass the baton for future generations. So anyway, uh, without further ado, uh, Bob Minkoff in 1974 began creating original cartoons and submitting them to magazines around New York. And in 77, he sold his first cartoon to The New Yorker and within three years became a regular contributor to the magazine. In 91, he started the Cartoon Bank, very big deal. A lot of people in the horrible history of comics didn't get paid enough, but with the Cartoon Bank, it was a repository of comics uh, that were published or not published in the New Yorker, and if you wanted to use one of those cartoons, you had to pay the Cartoon Bank, but you also put money in the cartoonist's pocket. Very, very important, revolutionary, really. Um, in 77, Minkoff was named the cartoon editor of The New Yorker, number three of the entire history of The, of the New Yorker, replacing uh, Lee Lorenz. He's edited multiple volumes of cartoon collections, including the incredible complete cartoons of The New Yorker. And he's lectured on the humor of university. Uh, he's lectured on humor at the University of Michigan. Recently, he was the subject of a segment on 60 Minutes with Morley Safer. He's going to be on uh, Charlie Rose very soon um, to promote this movie and also ideas of The New Yorker in New Yorker cartoons. So please look out for that. More than 900 of Minkoff's cartoons have been published in The New Yorker, including one of the most popular New Yorker cartoons of all time, which he gave to the title of his best-selling memoir, How About Never Is Never Good For You, My Life in Cartoons. And in part, also, this evening is a celebration of the softcover publication of this fantastic, really informed and insightful, funny book that has a lot of word image combinations, in the, including his own memoir and ideas of history of comics, humor, and The New Yorker. So please check it out. It's affordable now even for students because it's in soft cover. Um, but uh, also tonight, uh, we are uh, having a sneak preview of Very Semi-Serious. This is an incredible movie that's coming out on HBO, as you see on December 7th, also through theaters and festivals everywhere. And we are so privileged to have Bob Mankoff here to present it and his own work and his ideas. We'll be doing a Q&A afterwards, so please stick around for after the movie. But for now, please welcome Mr. Bob Mankoff. Thank you, Keith, for that wonderful infomercial. I really feel that's fantastic. I want to be a cartoonist now. Uh, that's great. But what, you know, what, what Keith said is true. I think that uh, look, the New Yorker was founded in 1925. And since then, 80,000 cartoons have been published. It's really one of the longest continuing comic traditions in American life, probably the longest continuing. And, uh, as a New Yorker cartoonist, uh, the New Yorker ethos is that humor is important. Cartoons are important. And it's different, really, than most places which would say that, because for the most part, humor gets sealed off on the children's table. OK? It's separate, right? Insulated somewhere else. It's either the funny pages or its own thing, or even in TV shows. But right in the New Yorker, right in the heart of the most serious discussions are also cartoons. And it's weird because the cartoons have nothing to do with any of the articles. They're not illustrations, zero. They're their own separate universe. When I became, <laughs> when I quit psychology to become a cartoonist, uh, my mother 
said, so they illustrate the articles. Uh, no. So they have something to do with the magazine? No. And she said, so why do they use them? And they use them because the idea of the sense of humor, the idea that there's more to life that the, that the, that the lightness tells you about the dark and, uh, and vice versa. And one of the things you know, that Keith mentioned and that I'm really here for is, yeah, you can buy my book. And by the way, if you buy it, I don't know, when Keith gets it to me, I'll draw a cartoon and, in it. And if that makes it more valuable, I'd like it back. <laughs> uh, but I'm really not here to promote, or even the film, because the film is going to do fine, and it's going to be on HBO, and frankly, it's already been on festivals and stuff. But I'm here to try to find young people who want to do this, because, first of all, it's doable, you know. It's, uh, keep talked about, uh, actually, when young cartoonists come in, and, and they see me, and they say, how many cartoons should I do a week? I say, 10, and when they say 10, and when I say 10, they ask me why 10. I say because 9 out of 10 things in life don't work out. And that's what you have to learn if you actually want to have a viable commercial career. And while Emily is teaching a course, uh, I'm also teaching a course every Tuesday. Every Tuesday at the New Yorker, I'm teaching a course because you can come in and show me your cartoons. And every year, new cartoonists come into the magazine. And if you get published in the magazine, actually, it's, it's, not bad, uh, it's not bad money. This film is a little bit more than, than just about, the, uh, like a color piece about the New Yorker cartoons. It's about me and my family, and about, it's about the human beings behind this. So uh, sit back and uh, enjoy it, and then me and Keith will have a discussion, and uh, you'll ask me questions, and I promise I'll answer all of them. Thank you. I, I want to thank you. I really want to thank you guys coming. You know, this plays to a lot of people, and usually they're, you know, middle-aged or older people. I'm happy you. Uh, I mean, the only reason I'm here is to change one person's life. Well, I will. I will open up things by saying that one. I'm very proud of our old student Julian Rowe, my old student who yeah. just got his fifth cartoon published in the New Yorker right. after only two years of trying. Yeah, I saw yeah, Julian, back is, there. Julian is great, and as you can see, this film is is about. Uh, so the people you see in this film, Leanna Fink, now is published regularly in the magazine. The amazing guy Ed Steed, since since he was in the magazine, is in all the time. And while his cartoons are sorted the same as what they were, there, you know, there's a whole efflorescence of his art and uh, everything else. And so, you know, so that's. Uh, the message, I think, of the film. And of course, the message is, to me, the message, you know, whether or not you become a cartoonist or a cartoonist for The New Yorker or are even interested in it, the message is, I think, much broader than that. If, what are you going to do with your life? In other words, what are you going to do with your creative life if that's going to be it? Because the, uh, you know, in the future, uh, for young people is going to be everything that can be done in a rule-based way is going to be done by computers. So what's going to be left is creative work. And are you going to find that creative work which gives you meaning? And I think you do. It could be this, it could be anything, but if you don't have the type of deep passion for it that the people have here for whatever you do, you know, you won't succeed. And if also, if you're not willing to put up with I was talking to Keith about this, about failure, but deep sorts of failure. You know, I was talking to Keith about the two types of failure that you'll, you'll, you'll find. You'll find that you're failing because you're, you're bad. You know, you stink. The work isn't good. You know, or, or, and, 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 and people will give you that input. And you will either take that input and personalize it and say, my work doesn't stink, you stink and you will fail because of that. And then there's the other type of failure where the person is wrong, your work is good, and they still don't accept it. 
because that's going to happen all the time also. So that's, that's what you, you know, or you can go into advertising. <laughs> well, it takes a thick skin. And, and uh, you know, one thing that we do, of course, in our classes is critiques all the time. And, and I think our students are very good about hearing productive, hopeful criticism. And then they have to think about, for them, if it was the right thing for them or not. And yeah. for many of the teachers, they're fine with, if you have a productive, healthy way of going through the ambivalence of the questioning and if you're able to make better art because of it, if you're professional all the way through it, you could take in kind what we're saying and, and make the changes or not. Of course, we always say in the real world, you should probably take the changes, and but also be very professional about doing so. And something about the process of submitting to you every Tuesday, I would think, is that it really is like cartooning grad school. It's free. It takes a thick skin, though, and you have to be dedicated. Well, I, I, I don't, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm New York. I'm Jewish. I'm not going to... You know what I mean? So I'm going to say, say it, but I'm actually very kind in terms of what I'm really trying to accomplish. So take Leanna, let's see, Leanna and Ed, you know, you could look at them and you could think they're somehow the same in some way. They're completely different. I'm not talking even about the art. I'm talking about how you have to deal with that personality. Leanna is delicate. You know, if you didn't gently massage her talent, she would go away. Ed, this like reed thin guy who is very laconic, when he has complete confidence in what he does. Nothing could dissuade him. When he says in the film, you know, he looks up, he's English, he's actually raised on a farm and now he lives in Taipei, a whole other story. Anyway, when he says, you know, I was traveling in Vietnam, okay, weird, right? And he saw the New Yorker online, and he said, oh, uh, I can do that. I wasn't sure I wanted to do it, but I could do it. You know what I mean? So he had complete confidence in it. And so that's the type. And I really don't have to do, I don't have to do much of anything with him because he has this thing in him that is, and it's partly because of the, the type of work he does. If you follow his work, which is, it's, it's almost cartoon math. Okay, it's not really related to his personality anyway. It's just, it's, it's juggling combinations and then, and the, he has art, he has real art, that's come out. Liana is everything coming from her soul, you know what I mean, a whole other part. I mean, people ask if there's a difference between men's humor and, uh, and women's humor. Now there's enormous overlap, but what I see in my particular world in cartoons is that like a guy like Sam Gross, well, it's like men's humor is math and women's humor is literature. <laughs> okay, it, it's not always like that, and that's a simplification, but I sort of see that. Well, it seems that you are very sensitive to the people who come to you, and but it is a professional situation, and of course we always impart upon our students to be very professional, but there are very few situations in the world, I would think, where you could present your cartoons and get the kind of feedback that you so generously give, and also have that community of people's before and after the meetings. I know that Julian um, really enjoys now being friends with Sam Gross. Yeah. And truly, going there has made his cartooning even better. And then once you get into the New Yorker, of course, it's like being on Mount Olympus. And he's getting a lot of other gigs doing cartooning yeah. for everything that he wouldn't otherwise get because he's in the New Yorker. It means something. Well, it is unusual. It's intergenerational. I mean, that's the, one of the messages of the movie. You know, however young you are, you'll be old at one point. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that, the fact that these careers overlap is just a wonderful story to see George Booth or you see Ed, and so that people in their 20s and their uh, 80s. I think it is unusual in that most places you won't, most, pay, most places are protecting themselves from the people submitting. You know, and I, that's the last thing I want to do. I really, I want to, partly because, you know, partly because it's, a, it, it, it's difficult to keep this going. You know, we're at a time in which uh, technology is sort of at war with culture. In that, I'm all about technology, Apple Watch, all of this stuff, but what technology enables is just enormous amounts of crap that people can make money on. Nor, you know, rather than any quality. So when you see what's being monetized, what's being monetized? Cats, pictures. 
I mean, that's, we, in other words, no one's paying for the pictures. You're not, you're not going to have a career creating cat pictures, okay? And so, in, and so the, 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 the money involved from, uh, you know, which is, I'm not criticizing you with Facebook or with Google or anything. The money is like when you go up to weather.com and you see all this clickbait, which is crap, you know, there's nothing good about it. It's not great cultural content, but that's what people are, so that's what, if, you, if you're if you gonna produce quality in anything, a graphic novel or anything like that, you know, that's that that's the hard future ahead in terms of actually making, a, you know, a, a, a making a career out of it, and money is not, you know, let me try to put it this way. Money's not the most important thing, you know, if, you know, for a career. But if no one anywhere will pay you money for anything you do, it's a problem. In other words, you can't possibly have a career. I'll, I'll say a couple of things, and then I do really yeah. want to open up things for questions, but one, you know, of course at SBA, we really teach comics for the art of it. Yeah. That is poetry. That is a language yeah. unlike any other. And it's really hard to make work where you see yourself reflected in the work that you're making. That really is about you and an idea of communication, pure communication. I love that you're really endorsing people to speak from their heart, from their minds, sometimes consciously, sometimes by going on instinct. But you're really looking for that personal voice instead of just more desert island jokes or guys behind desk well, jokes or yeah. well, are no washes. Well, look, I mean, you know, so much of the future ahead of these kids is algorithms. You know, you're just going to be fed what you liked, and you like this, and now you like more of that, and, and you know, it's being monetized and everything. So where, what is the future for people but creativity, but personal voice? It seems like you're really promoting the art of it. Yeah. as well as the humor, and also willing to embrace technology, because of course you guys well, are also you, you doing the online. technology, but I just do think that the human spirit and humor, and so, you know, one of the things is just looking in all the forms, whether it's graphic novels or anything in that, everybody wants gravitas, gravitas, you know what I mean? You know, this thing, this, you know, th this thing. And if you don't have this other, look, the default condition of life is actually sort of melancholy and even sad. Okay, that's the default. We're, we're, we have to move around seriously. But if you don't have that other side of it to balance it, well, then I don't think you have a full life. So that's what I well, thought. I found that very poignant, of course, in the film. Like, you yeah. have to laugh, right? And a lot of The New Yorker is about, like, bringing a good spirit as well as a smart poignancy to life, maybe. Well, look, I mean, the, this film obviously has an enormous sadness and poignancy for me considering the tragedy of my family. But one of the things... <laughs> I wish that had not happened, but the part of the message of the film is that you need you need humor for the resilience you're going to need in life. I mean, people ask me, well, because I submitted, I don't know, a thousand cartoons to New York. How did you, what, what type of grit did you have? What type of resilience? Well, you know, there's going to be things in life that are going to hit you a lot harder than people rejecting your cartoon. And are you going to be able to keep going when a friend dies or a lover or a child or anything, are you going to keep going? I don't mean just keep going because selfishly, but you're going to find that if you don't have something like that in your life, if you can't draw on those resources, it's going to be difficult. So the whole arc of the film is about resilience a little bit uh, because the New Yorker itself, I mean, I don't want to take, when I look at a legacy, I feel that, well, you know what, I kept it alive. It could easily have just become a complete museum with the older people and stuff, but keeping it alive. And then, of course, the World Trade Center itself, that's where we are. Yeah, so maybe we, we, yeah I think there's a good point to open yeah. up the floor. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yes, please. And, and there are mics here that are set up, at, but also if you just speak loud, you, you it's probably, probably here. Yeah, I, uh, what do New Yorker cartoons draw the well, new people from the, old, from the old stuff? Well, I was talking to Keith. Everything that exists is a thread from the past. Every sitcom you see has a basis in Greek comedy and types, going back to Commedia dell'arte and vaudeville. What you think is now is, is now, but it, everything has a thread to the, everything you do, uh, everything in comedy, everything in song, everything. And so to be creative in any field, you have to immer immerse yourself in the domain of that field. 
You have to know that field. You're not going to create a great song unless you know a lot of songs. Anybody, whether it's what was Steven Spielberg doing his whole life, he was watching films. So if all of so when someone comes to me and they say I have an idea for a cartoon or something, and they don't, I, I don't mean they have to study it, but they, but in other words, they don't immerse themselves in the domain of it. It'd be like you're going to do a graphic novel and you've never, and you haven't looked at very many of them. And so I think all the cartoonists who succeed immerse themselves in the domain, like everybody else. They're over-influenced by it, then they bring themselves to it and they create something new. They create something new. But you can only create something new from the old. You can't create, nothing comes from nothing. So I do think they're enormously influenced by that and that they, and that they respect it. That's right, history is doomed to repeat itself unless you, you know it. And of course, it's, it's just, that's the wealth of American cartooning. When you're looking through um, now online, the bank of New Yorker cartoons is fantastic, but then of course it's about the future well, too. You know, it depends how much you want in, in the history. You can go back to Punch. You can go back to you. You know, I, t I teach. I will teach in a course in Swarthmore in the psychology of humor, but also comedy. And I just like to go back and you see how far, how far back can you trace something? You know what I mean? To where you see uh, its roots, and then for you to do it, you understand you're part of a great tradition. You know what I mean? And, you know, and part of that is to pass that on. Other questions? Anybody? Come on. Yes, in the back there. Yeah. Uh, do you think there's a difference between your cartoons and other... Alex, can you... Alex, can you speak up? Do you think there's a difference between New Yorker cartoons and other, like, one-panel cartoons, like Forrest Rabbit, Book Club? Yeah. You know, is there, is there a difference? I think that there's no difference in any single cartoon. You know what I mean? There's difference in a corpus of it. What, 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 what defines the New Yorker cartoon is its incredible eclecticism. Do you know what I mean? Its wideness. You know, so Gary Larson is great, but generally he was working one thing and, and one artist. And uh, Gary Larson quit, you know? He stopped cartooning because he Too burnt many talking him. animals. He, he burnt it out the, sort of the trope. He got tired of it. One of, one of the things about the great cartoonists, and actually Gary Larson, of course, is a great cartoonist. Someone like Roz, Roz kept developing. She kept changing, kept moving constantly. And so I think one of the things that a New Yorker gives you the chance to do is put your success behind you and be creative. It's not completely driven by, oh, people like this. At a certain point, you can decide, I don't like it anymore. I don't like it anymore. And the New Yorker gives you, so that definitely happened with Ed Steed. The stuff you would saw in, in this, because this is two years old, it's very simple drawing. All of a sudden, Ed in his drawings started to become what I thought was overcomplicated. There would be a pirate, and in the, in it would be a pirate joke, but the pirate looked insane. And he looked like a bodybuilder for some reason. And, I, and, and you know, Ed draws directly with ink, you know? And, and it got like Rococo and, and crazy. And so and originally I said, you know, I think you're starting to like lose the idea. And then I said, mm, let's see where it goes. Let's see where it goes. You know what I mean? Because every once in a while you gotta realize someone, you know, someone it, it takes a different track. So I think that's the, the thing also that distinguishes the New Yorker cartoons is the ethos of the New Yorker. It's part of the New Yorker. It's not separate, it's not a comic supplement. It's right there in the text with all the other serious stuff, so it has the respect. The other thing that distinguishes it is that it goes through the fact checking and grammar checking and checking of the New Yorker, just like the article. So every cartoon that we pick at a meeting we, comp we look at compared to all the 80,000 cartoons that ever ran so that we don't duplicate it. And we make mistakes, but, but we care. So I think that's the thing about The New Yorker that, that probably distinguishes the article also. That we there's, a, there's really no other publication like it. I mean, this is the, the thing that I, that, you know, I grew up with National Lampoon. Yeah. I grew up with all kinds of magazines that had gag cartoons, but they didn't have that well, National, Cartoon, National Lampoon was very interesting, yeah. and Sam Gross, of course, had a great career in it, but it doesn't seem like they have that kind of mandate to take cartoons seriously and have it really part of the text and really to support the idea of an idiosyncratic language that a cartoonist could bring to a table. 
and, and to treat it like the it's, art and language well, that it's it is. part of the New Yorker baked into the DNA of the New Yorker is process. I, I, I did cartoons for the National Lampoon, and those were great creative guys, but they were on drugs, and they were drunk, and they did a great thing, and then they all were gone. Okay, they didn't have any process. They just had people. Okay, they had people who were talented, and then, and then they weren't, or they were dead. Okay, the New Yorker going back has a process. So when we do a cartoon, it goes through like seven levels. You know, it goes to, you know, the, the grammar gets checked, and that it could be wrong. I could say, well, no, you're wrong about that. It's because because the person is speaking. The uh, the image, if it, if there's some fact, then gets checked. The article. So everything goes through a process. So when Tina Brown takes over, when Bob Gottlieb takes over from William Shawn, and William Shawn from Howard Ross and Tina, the process is greater. I mean, in a way, it's a little bit like, let's say, the Constitution or the government. There are all these rules in place so that every Tuesday there's going to be a meeting, there's going to be someone there, and we're going to do the same things that we do. So I think that's, the, that's a big deal. Well, of course, The New Yorker has incredible articles, some of the best writing in the world for a magazine, and I like that there's no hierarchy, really. The cartoons aren't just merely a supplement. They're really, you guys take them as seriously as any journalist. Or and of something. course, there's Francois Moulet, who does the covers, and that's another, you know, field. He's a that, teacher at SVA. Yeah, and, and and, and you know that's the, that is that is fantastic as well. So let's see, if we have any other people who want to ask questions? Yeah, go ahead. Do you teach any uh, courses here in New York City? What's that? Do you teach here in New York City any courses? I well, one of the things is I I I I, I the course I, I I make a joke, but the course I'm teaching is at the magazine. You know that's really where what I'm doing, is, and I have a lot to do there, uh, and. Um, like I said, I'll be teaching, of course, in the, in the, in the psychology of humor. Uh, but, but Emma, what we want to try to establish as SVA, and this, this is the thing, really, is, is we want to try to start a tradition of, 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 of New Yorker cartoonists coming in and planting the seeds. It's like the, the, the problem now for us in terms of diversity is not women cartoonists. The problem is, uh, you know, just more diversity. Black cartoonists. Hispanic cartoonists, actually we have an Asian cartoonist, Amy Huang and stuff, but I want different viewpoints. That can't happen overnight, you know what I mean? But you start somewhere. You know, we want to start a tradition here at SVA where some, some, some person starts to take this course and they have a feel for it, a talent. You've got to have some, you know, people ask me, can you, can you learn to be funny? Well, anybody who's a comedian learned Anybody who does stand-up learns. Everybody can learn. You have to have some talent to, to begin with. But, but I think more important is real drive. Real, you know, real drive and ambition for it. And, and toning it, toning the craft, and, and learning the, not only the nuts and bolts, but being able to harness the humor and the drawing and to really make the thing that is yeah, just to, the perfect to re machine. Right? I mean, we talked about process in the New Yorker, the process of work, work, work. I mean, you talked about professionals and stuff. The difference between a professional and an amateur is an amateur really likes everything they do, <laughs> okay? And a professional is dissatisfied, almost always somewhat dissatisfied. The, the amateur is the person who gives you that one cartoon and is thrilled. <laughs> They're thrilled. They say, I, and, and they cannot understand why well, you don't understand this is the world's greatest cartoon. That, that they've had one idea for a cartoon. So a good example is the caption contest, too, which I run, which is the back page. It's an in Congress picture. And I get the, you know, and, and that's the outside people. Okay, I get the five to 10,000 entries every week. And you get these jerks who are absolutely sure their caption was the best. And then sometimes I actually have to send them, this was your caption. Here are the 400 that were just like it. <laughs> So it's interesting, yeah. I always think to be a great artist, you have to do think about the best thing you've ever done, the best cartoon you've ever done, and then you beat it. And then your job is to beat that. And then you keep doing that so you get really old and you can have ice cream and I die. mean, it's a balance. And also, you, you also have to understand that the on a practical side, the magazine has to get outside, out the door. Every week, every week, this magazine has to appear on the newsstands. So... You know, you, you do the best you can. And uh, uh, the truth is, and there's nothing infallible about it. 
You can publish a bad cartoon. You can like a bad, bad in that other people won't like it. And there's sort of a funny thing that happens. OK, let's say there's a cartoon in The New Yorker that's not good. Everyone agrees, this is a terrible cartoon. OK. Someone sees that cartoon. OK, it's like going to a Major League Baseball game and watching someone strike out and say, I could strike out. <laughs> Why aren't I playing? <laughs> So someone sees a bad cartoon and they say, I could do something like that. You know, so there are all sorts of, but all, all those people are not, you know, are not professionals. One of the good things about the internet, in fact, is we're exposed to all talent. We have an idea of actually how hard it is to, you know, to get. Let, okay, the example is something like, okay, I wanted to learn Rubik's Cube. So I worked at it, I worked at it, and then I could do it. I could do it. It's like it takes me two minutes, but I can do it. And there's a, some eight-year-old kid in Japan blindfolded who can do it in 11 seconds with one hand. <laughs> so you're exposed to the fact that there is very, very great talent when you're, when you're in anything competitive. And uh, hopefully the ethos is you just keep at it and you keep working. So I, I love the, the older guard, these lions and yeah. lionesses when we're talking about Ross, who are just keep at it and living through their art and they still come to the meetings, they're still talking to you and they're, they're keeping it going and living through their art and, and trying. Well, well, you know, Roz did, I don't know if, any of you read this book Roz did, which was, uh, can we talk about something more pleasant, which is about her parent, 94, five-year-old parents dying. And uh, you, you really understand, uh, <laughs> you know, what, the, what simple cartoons like this can do. Um, do we have more questions? Okay, uh, yes, please, and yes, please, okay. go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, you go first, and then I'll finish. Um, going back to your second point about failure, about kind of the person being wrong, yeah. um, I'm wondering, as kind of like the singular arbiter of comedy for The New Yorker, does self-doubt for you ever come into play? And I'm kind of curious, not so much of like, if you self-doubt like whether or not someone's going to find what you accept as funny, but that you're passing on something that might actually be revolutionary. Yeah, I always... I, I want to always, I mean, my joke is I'm the king of cartoons, not the pope, so I'm not infallible. <laughs> okay, and, 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 and I, I always try so hard to open myself up to things that I naturally don't like, that I naturally don't, it's always easy to go, you know, in, with the stream and, and see what is here. What is here? What can I learn from it? That other, that especially if other people like it, what am I seeing? And sometimes I'll come back to my conclusion is that it's it's still crap, okay? It's still crap. It's you're seeing a social phenomenon. You're seeing meta humor or something. You know what I mean? Because one of the things that's happening here because of the combustibility of the internet and its virality is that you can mistake this virality, this combustibility in the moment for actual content, just because it hits the moment. You know, look at the topicality as fuel. And with this type of fuel, when someone says something in a moment, and it's everything, humor is primarily social. So there's all this fuel, all you need is the tiniest spark, and it blows up in a joke. But there's not actually much there. Not actually much there. And on the other hand, I'm, when I'm looking at stuff, other stuff that comes in, that, it, that doesn't have all this social penumbra or, of it. And I'm saying, okay, what's here? Am I, am, I not, am I not seeing, first of all, that maybe, maybe these women are making a joke differently? It's a little bit, maybe it's more narrative. Maybe it's a different thing. You know, when, when you see, when I'm first looking at Liana, I'm not naturally responding to her stuff. I'm not naturally responding to it like I am to some to Ed Steve. But I am, see, I, I, when, I, when I say that, I said, I, I don't know, you, you, you try to go to this open trance state, you know, where you try to commune with it a little bit, like it's art, saying, what's here, what's here, it's different, and that, and you let that thing, so I really try to, be, and the New Yorker, like, see, the New Yorker, you, you asked before, what's different about the New Yorker? There's an essential aspirational part of it that seeks to go beyond what it is, and therefore, the reader, someone who's involved in it also is drawn. So when they see the cartoon, they're put in the, the, the frame of mind, I hope that I am, to saying, what's here? The New Yorker picked it, what's here? They're not playing a prank on me, okay? 
what is here that, that I should try to appreciate? So that's, uh, and, and, and no question at a certain point they should get rid of me and get somebody else. But <laughs> because at a certain time, you know, really you gotta move off the stage. But, but right now I'm into this mentoring and legacy and, you know, and, you know, and, and moving it on. Mark, you had a question you were gonna ask. Yeah. Most people who I want jobs most of their lives don't, don't allow them to smile very much. And they look for humor to get away from things. Yeah. They're low. What if someone just deals every day with humor to they want to get away from everything? <laughs> that's a good po that's a good point because <laughs> I mean, that, that's, you know, that's a good point. I mean, I, I love humor of all different types, so I still sort of consume that. But the, there's actually something about humor that also relates to melancholy. There's, uh, humor is sad. It, because it, in some way, I mean, Mark Twain said this, the secret source of humor is not joy, but sorrow. It deals with what's bad and imperfect. Tragedy, which seems like it's very sad, is actually hopeful. Because it's like, hey, if they just didn't have this flaw, you know what I mean? It reaches the ideal. Humor and comedy, right from the beginning, accepts our flaws. Uh, George Orwell says, jokes don't degrade us. They say we are degraded. So there's something a little bit uh, E.B. White has a great quote, which is, well, not a guy won't get it exact, but, it, but that, you know, people think, and this is not, they're not just cartoonists, but humorists, that, that, that they're uh, really very sad people. That's the cliche, right? And that it's sort of, they're clowns with breaking hearts. And he said he thought that was, there was some grain of truth in that, but it was badly put. That, that there is a deep strain of melancholy running throughout human existence and that humorists are more sensitive to it and that they actively respond to it positively. And I think that's what, ha what happens. When you do cartoons during the day, you're not laughing, you're not like in a joyous state, but you are satisfied that you're dealing, you know, uh, uh, that you're dealing with, I mean, sometimes it's whimsy and sometimes you're dealing with really, with, with really deep issues. So, I mean, uh, that, and, and of course, we, let me see, if, what if I, you know, am I going to laugh when I see Louis C.K. and Seinfeld and stuff? Of course. I mean, I could watch, I could watch you know, some of these. Yeah, I could watch Monty Python forever. Well, I remember the anecdote that we were talking about before when we met when you said that when people come off a roller coaster, they laugh because they didn't die. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, humor really is the antidote, I think. Yeah, well, the, uh, uh, I mean, laughter, you know, the, the very... When the towers went down, we didn't do any cartoons in that next issue because sometimes there is no humor, you know what I mean, in, when there's death at that moment. But what we were going to do, the week after, we did start doing cartoons and we had to find the right cartoon and the right cartoon, which was this benign sort of soft cartoon, was a Leo Cullum cartoon where this is a week after the towers come down where a woman is looking at a guy and he's got this garish jacket on and she's saying... <sighs> I thought I'd never laugh again until I saw that jacket. And even though that cartoon is silly and everything, it's appropriate because it, it was an antidote to, to the idea after tragedy that we weren't going to be human beings anymore uh, and that humor was over and irony was over. I mean, people said everything changed, but everything changed except people. They remained, uh, you know, they remained the same. So in a very practical way, what is, the, what is the process for the New Yorker if people want to submit? Of course, hopefully they're going to take Emily Flake's class as the continuing ed class on Wednesday nights, as I mentioned. Also the undergrad class, not to advertise too much, yeah. next fall. But truly, okay. that would be okay. the well, first step. Well, the practical way is you know, what you talked about. Familiarize yourself with the field a little bit. Don't come from this lecture if you haven't done it and say, oh, here's my New Yorker cartoon. You know, get the complete cartoons of New York. Buy my book. No, <laughs> it wouldn't hurt. I mean, really, I don't it is really buy it. The books, the history the books doing okay, but it's not, it's not a day. Look at the magazine. Think about it. Then, then start drawing. And initially, if you haven't done it, the drawing won't be hard if you can draw. But the ideas will be hard. 
the ideas will be hard. And, and then see if you can do that. Because wh what will happen is that you, it'll be very hard for you to get ideas at the start. You'll, you'll remember ideas you've had your whole life and you'll throw a few things, you know what I mean? And then you'll have six ideas. <laughs> and then you'll think, shit. <laughs> and nothing will come. And then you'll come back the next week and you'll start to build a critical mass of associations you had. You'll look at a lot of cartoons and then it will come. And do that for a couple of months and then come and see me. <laughs> I mean, it's that simple. Or you can, you could actually, now we have a system. You saw Colin there, Colin stuff. Now we have a system where you submit online to, with submittable, because that way we can get back to people. But, you know, anybody here can, you call the New Yorker, you call Colin Stokes, you say, I want to come in on Tuesday. You call up, you know, we, we get past security after we take DNA samples, and, you know, you're fine. And you, come, and you come and see me, and, you, and then you meet this great group of people. And be dedicated, and also be dedicated to looking, right? Yeah. Looking, and watching, and seeing, yeah. and recording. It's very yeah, important. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I look forward to seeing uh, at least one of you. I'll be disappointed if I don't. Well, I mean, this is really why we're having this evening. And really, truly, please take Emily Flake's class next year in the fall if you're an undergrad. If you're a person out in the world, take her class on Wednesday nights. I think you'll really enjoy it. And uh, Bob is very generous in that he's providing that golden carrot, that he will really review the work at the very end of this class. And so please, we hope to see you in these classes and really plant seeds for the future, because it really is very truly about the future of not only, hopefully, your careers, maybe doing this, but the future and of the I New Yorker. Just to conclude, I just want to thank Keith, because how great he is. He's just open. I'm sure you guys know him in that he's a wonderful artist himself and uh, just giving me the opportunity. Anyway, I want to thank well, you. That's very sweet. And thank you very much, Bob. And thank you for your dedication to American cartooning in general and for these people and for the legacy of the New Yorker. I really appreciate it. All right.